Get your Bibles, open it to James chapter 5, verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. For an example of suffering and affliction and whatever it is. Is that right? And of patience. It says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. It says there was a suffering, and now he's referring especially to the man Job. Okay? He went through a lot of sufferings if you ever read the book. His patience was tested. And then we see the end of the Lord with him. The book of Job, chapter 1, it says the following. It says the man Job, the man Job, that is Job chapter 1, was the richest, was the richest man in the east. Then we read how he started losing everything and how he went through suffering and afflictions till he sat on the ash heap and the dogs came licking his sores and he was in a pitiful shape. Is that right? But then we get an awesome story in chapter 8. He says, verse 6, If you are pure and upright, God will bestir himself for you and make your righteous dwelling prosperous again. And though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would greatly increase. Job was the richest man. Then he lost all. Is that right? Then he had a prophecy. The prophecy says, although your beginning. Oh, Jesus help. Beginning was small. Now the small beginning is the richest man in the east. God says, your latter end will greatly increase. So uh, here we get scripture after scripture. James chapter 5 said, we saw the end of the Lord with Job. Job chapter 8 says, although your beginning was small, yet your latter end shall greatly increase. So we have for the second time, the end of the Lord with Job, which is not the end of his life. Which is the end in a beginning. Which is a new beginning. But it's the end of the sufferings and afflictions. We bring an end of the sufferings. An end to affliction. An end to poverty. An end to struggles. An end to moanings and groanings. The end of the Lord is not the end of His life. It's actually the beginning of the real life. It's actually the end of the sufferings. And that is the patience of the Lord will now come in. So in Job 42... Uh, you can just pick it up there, verse 1 through verse 10 especially. It says in verse 10, and God restored. Okay, Job 42. This is chapter 8. That is chapter 1. Chapter 42 says, God turned the captivity of Job. God turned his captivity and God restored his fortunes and he had twice as much as he had before. So that was not his end. That was the end of the trials, afflictions, sufferings. But it was actually the beginning of another 140 years. Because the Bible says he lived 140 years and he had wives and he had children and he had cattle and he had donkeys and he had sheep. It's there in your Bible. You can go check it out. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Are you ready? Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. <laughs> he said we saw the suffering of Job and the patience that he got. And the end of the Lord with him. Our God is pitiful and full of mercy. Now we see Job was the richest man in the east. He lost everything. Then he have a prophecy. 
Though your beginning was small, your latter end will greatly increase. So in 42, God turned his captivity and restored his fortunes and he had twice as much as before. That was the end of that time and the beginning of a life filled with peace and joy and happiness and prosperity. God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. It's thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Oh man, oh man, if you've got ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. God says, The Bible says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I gave you now three witnesses out of God's word that God wants you to have an expected end. That doesn't mean you must expect to end. God says you must expect that there will be an end to a certain thing in your life which will bring a start to a new thing. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I'm giving you, but you must expect the end of it all and expect the new thing to start in your life. Then shall you call upon me. (laughs) So your end is you shall start calling. I I hope you're going to understand where we're getting at today. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. (laughs) I I I just feel God wants to speak to us today, man. God says, I'm going to turn your captivity. Are you expecting the end of the... So I'm going to give you an expected end. What is your expectation for your future life? What are you expecting will happen to you? What are you expecting? Are you only waiting for heaven one day? Are you only waiting to die and then go to heaven? Or do you know that God right here on this earth has got plans for your life of peace and prosperity and joy and happiness? God turned Job's captivity while he was on earth and gave him another 140 pleasant prospects prosperous glorious years so god says i want to give you an expected end too can you expect that romans 8 verse 19 says the following Mm -hmm. creation creation waits with expectation For the revealing of the sons of God. Then the Amplified would put in brackets the disclosing. So there's an expectation in all of creation for one thing. And that's for the sons of God to be revealed. And that will be the disclosing of their sonship. In other words, immaturity, rebellion, stubbornness, sickness, disease will pass away. And they will come forth in perfection. They will come forth as the son of God. They will come forth with a full anointing of the Christ life. And they will not be bound by limits. They will rise up and rule and reign in this life in one Christ Jesus come on I know the thoughts that I think about you says almighty God of peace and not of evil of a prosperous future and of an expected end what do you expect God to do in and for and through you verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1 says Jesus the son now he says in verse 2 the son That's right. okay God spoke by the prophets but now by the son yeah. Now it talks about the Son. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. He is the light being, I'm reading Amplified, the outraying of radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. <laughs> uh, Upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. 
when he had by offering himself accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. Now he says of the son, he is the perfect imprint, the image of the invisible God, the outraying glorious presence of the divine. Ephesians 4 says, when Christ ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for ministering. So we all come to the unity of the faith. I'm just quoting here and there. So we all reach perfection, oneness, that is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection coming forth in the very image of the Son of God. So if the Son is the perfect image and imprint of the divine and the sons will come forth, they will be the perfect image and imprint of the divine. They will look like, walk like, talk like. So the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do. Because I go to the Father. Philip, have I been with you so long and you have not seen me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now you go and show me to the people. Father, I pray as I and you are one. I pray that they will be one with you. I in them and they in me and we in... Verse 13. Besides, to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool or a stool for your feet. Now we've read in verse 3 that he is the image of the divine and he, after he brought one offering for all times, sat down. the right hand now we know Luke 22 verse 66 7 and 8 says at the right hand of power at the right hand of God or the right hand of the majesty or the right hand of the divine different scriptures have different words but it's at the right hand of God which is the power which is everything now he says when he sat down at the right hand this is what he heard till so Jesus is not going to make another move till creation is satisfied that their expectation has been fulfilled that the sons of God has now come forth. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. Yes, he's been coming soon for 2,000 years. But your Bible and the one that I'm preaching out of says, sit till the enemies are under So who's going to do that? So let's go to chapter 2. Verse 10. For it became him, just King James, from whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. We saw the suffering of Job, the patience that he had and the end of the Lord which was actually the beginning of a better life twice as much before his captivity turned now Jeremiah says I know the thoughts that I think towards you peace and prosperous future and not evil to give you an expected end now creation waits with expectation what are you expecting for the revealing of the sons of God now Jesus is a perfect image of the divine of the unseen God the Father Almighty which is spirit so he suffered, paid once and for all offering. Never will there be another sacrifice, another offering. Then sat down at the right hand until his enemies are under his feet. So we see the sufferings of Jesus, which is the end of the Lord with him there. Now he's sitting and now the next thing on the agenda is the revealing of many sons. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. John 17, the prayer of Jesus. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, 
saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that the power of death that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now remember, if we are Christ, then where are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If the Son is the supreme ruler with maximum authority, if the Son is the one that can command storms to be still and dead to come out and cripples to walk, if the Son has in glory, you know, and we are supposed to be the sons, but we don't see it yet. Now remember, Adam was the son of God and he had authority over all creation. Now we don't see that people have all authority. Now, verse 8. He says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. This is normal man. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put on him. But now we see not yet. I want you to circle the word yet. Verse 9. But we see Jesus. See, you got to come to a place in your life where you can see Jesus in this whole fashion. Therefore, Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says, While we are surrounded by us with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the price that was set before him endured the sufferings. So, chapter 1 and 2, he endured the sufferings, which was the one and Final for all suffering for all time. Sat down at the right hand. Now we see the sufferings. And the next thing is many sons must now come into glory. Not one day in heaven. Not when we die. Right here on this earth. Creation is in expectation. And now God wants to give you that expected end. What are you expecting? In Luke 2, 21 to 31, it more or less says the following. That Jesus was brought into the temple to do according to the custom of the Jews. Remember? But there was a man in the temple by the name of Simeon. And he was expecting the consolation of Israel. And as he was busy with his duties in the temple, Joseph and Mary brought in Jesus to be done to him according to the customs of the Jews. And the Bible says, and Simeon said, as he was expecting the consolation of Israel to come. Now, according to history, this man Simeon was blind. He couldn't, they led him into the temple. And according to customs, there were hundreds of babies dedicated because they only brought them certain times of the month. So there were lots of babies coming in. And as Simeon was standing there, he said, and as they brought Jesus, he started prophesying. He said, now my eyes have seen. He said, now Lord, let your servant die in peace. For I have expected and now I have seen the consolation of Israel. Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit is poured out. Peter is preaching. And this is what he says, verse 22. You men of Israel, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth. Now I want you to think of the son. A man accredited. Pointed out. Shown forth. Commended and attested. By God. By the mighty works. And the power of performing wonders. And signs. Which God worked through him. Right in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus. When delivered up. Remember the suffering. According to the definite and fixed purpose and settled plan and foreknowledge of God. That's the end result. You crucified. You crucified. Verse 32. This Jesus for the third time. God raised him up. Verse 33. 
being therefore lifted high by and to the right hand and having received from the Father the promised blessing which is the Holy Spirit, he has made this outpouring which you yourselves both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, yet he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand and share my throne. That is Revelations 3.18. Until I make your enemies a footstool. That is Psalm 110. All prophecies, come on. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel recognize be all doubt and acknowledge as surely that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucify. This Jesus whom you crucified. I want you to know God raised him up and set him at his own right hand. Now we've read that in three different portions of scriptures already today. But this Jesus God made. Lord. And God made Christ. Okay. Jesus Christ the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus the Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. How many times do you read that in the Bible? So if you understand that, you're going to see a lot of things. So in Matthew 1, 21, it says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. So that's the Savior. Philippians 2, verse 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things on earth, things on earth, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, uh, Philippians 2.11, that is maximum or supreme authority or rulership. Okay? Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah. Others, John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? Oh, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus isn't called the Son of God. The Lord isn't called the Son of God because He has said to my Lord, sit sit to my hand, right hand. The Lord has said to my Lord, sit to my right hand. Jesus is Savior, but Christ is Son. (laughs) Because Jesus, the Lord, is God. What is Christ? Christ is the English of the Greek Christos of the Hebrew Mashiach, which is called to be rubbed in or on, which in brackets is anointing. So Jesus is Savior. Lord is supreme authority. Christ is that which comes upon you. That which is rubbed on you. That is rubbed into you. That which is the ointment of the anointing. Which is called Christ. So we take that and box it up in Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulders. Luke chapter 3. Jesus is now baptized. Simeon has prophesied, Anna have prophesied, and now Jesus is baptized. Verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and while he was still praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Now remember in chapter 4, verse 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me. So take that word anointing out and say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, that makes me Christ. And because I'm Christ, I am anointed. That makes me son, Christ. And because I'm Christ anointed, I can now bring healing to the sick, recovery of sight to the blind, bind up the brokenhearted, preach the gospel to the poor. It's the anointing, the Christ that makes it possible. So creation is waiting for, expecting for sons to come to the front. They already saw one. Now they're waiting for the multitude of sons. 
The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. A voice came from heaven. I hope you're going to shout. Saying, you are my son. <laughs> when did he say you are my son? When the Holy Spirit came upon him, heavens opened and a voice said, This is now the Son. So this Jesus, God made him Christ. God made him Lord. He was born Jesus. He was made Christ and he was made Lord. He was made Christ by the anointing. He was made Lord by the resurrection from the dead. But he was born Jesus. Oh, come on, man. This is awesome stuff. Let's turn around to chapter 4. Then Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit. You can just put it in there. Then Jesus being the Christ. Then Jesus anointed. You can put it in there. Returned from the Jordan was led in by the Holy Spirit. For during 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were completed, he was hungry. Then after 40 days, here comes the devil. If you are the son of God, order the stones to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It is written, Man shall not live and be sustained on bread alone, but by every word and expression from God. Then the devil took him on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, the habit of the world in a moment's time. Said to him, To you I will give all this power and authority and the glory, for it has been turned over to me, and I will give it to whomever I will. Therefore, if you will do homage and do worship me, it shall be yours. Jesus replied, Get behind me, Satan. It is written, You shall homage and do worship to the Lord your God, and him only you will serve. Then he took him to Jerusalem and set him on a gable of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here. Okay, what was the temptation? Sonship. If you are the Son of God. Turn it into bread. Jump from this temple. Okay. Verse 13. When the devil had ended every complete cycle of temptation, he temporarily left him. He stood off from him until another more opportune and favorable time. Satan tempted him with sonship because when he came out of the baptismal water, the Holy Spirit came upon him and God spoke, you are my son. So when he went into the desert, the devil watched him for 40 days and the devil came and said, if you are the son. I heard it at the, at the Jordan, man. Now, if you are the son, then you're supposed to do miracles. Come on, let's turn this bread, the loaves into, or stones into bread. Come on, let's jump down from the temple. You are the Son of God. I heard it. If you can do it, let's do it, man. And after the temptation, Satan departed from him. The Bible says, until a more opportune and favorable time. So for three and a half years, Jesus is performing signs, wonders, miracles. Just look at verse 41, man. I think that's the right verse. Devils came out of many crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. Come on, they didn't want the Son of God to be on the earth because they knew that is what was lost in the garden with Adam. He lost his sonship and they knew somewhere there's a prophecy that there will come a second man that will be the last Adam that will bring forth again sonship into the earth. Creation is waiting and when they heard this is a son, all devils were banned. Wow, it can't be the son. If it's the Son, it's our end. <laughs> because it said of the Son in Psalm 110, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. It said of the Son, you will raise him up. So there's all the prophecies of the Son and the devils knew it. And here they hear from heaven, this is my Son. Now they said, if you are the Son. So when Jesus walked in the city, all demons cried, You are the Christ, the Son. You are the Christ, the Son. They didn't tempt him. They proclaimed it. Jesus had no problem in calling out sick people, dead people, touching briars, let them walk again, wheelchairs, cripple. No problem. He ruled as the Son of God. So Satan stopped his temptation until a more opportune time. So we never hear for three and a half years where Jesus was tempted. I know he was tempted in all ways like as we are. Where was he tempted? When he went to the cross. That's where he had to finish temptation, sin and unrighteousness. 
But before that, we just hear how we lived in victory, man. So here comes the crucifixion, Matthew 27. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Also verse 40. Here hangs two thieves, one on the left and one on his right. And the one starts provoking the other one. He says, uh, let's just, you know, challenge this man. If you are the son of God, why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself and us? That is a more opportune time. That is a more favorable time. Jesus said, do you know that I can ask my father for a legion of angels and it will be at my disposal like that? He says, but this time I will take this last temptation in my son and I will prove I will be obedient unto death. And when I come out, I will not just be Jesus Christ. I will be the Lord Jesus Christ. So Simeon says, I have a prophetic word that I am expecting to not die before I have seen the Lord's Christ. So the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. But Simeon had a prophetic word that he will stay alive until he saw the Lord's Christ. Until he saw the anointed one of God as the son of God coming to the earth. To get back what was lost in the garden. To bring restoration to humanity. So that now creation can expect not a son but many sons to come forth and be the people that God intended them to be. In Jesus name. So we are ready to enter a time and a season and a whatever so whosoever so whatsoever. Let's go to Romans 8. Now remember where we started with the sufferings and the patience. The end of the Lord. The captivity turned and the thoughts of God. Verse 17. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also. Yeah. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Not of Christ. With Christ. So we share his anointing. The works that I do shall ye do also. And greater works than these shall ye do because I go to my Father. What happened when he went to the Father? Acts 2. Jesus accredited, pointed forth, shown forth by the miracle powers. You crucified, but God raised him up. And after receiving the promise of the Father, he has made this outpouring what you now see and hear. Come on, somebody must understand what we're talking about. If we are joint heirs with Christ, <laughs> so we got that same anointing. I go to the Father. What happened when he went to the Father? He poured out the same anointing. Only we must share his suffering <laughs> if we are to share his glory. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. Now I've got to put that on the board because that's going to be a point in our message today. God says, I know the thoughts that I have about your future. But you've got to understand the sufferings of the present time. If you want to enter the thoughts of the future, which is an expected end, which will brought an end to suffering and bring forth the disclosing of sonship, which will bring you forth as a Christ person. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Oh, it says the sufferings of this present time. Do you want to compare it to the glory that will be ours? Must I put it in now or do we do it later? Or do we do it now and later? Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. I just quoted. We're going to read maybe later on. He says, the sufferings of this present time. Same words are not worth to be compared to the glory <laughs> that should follow. But the only way we can get it is by not looking at the sufferings which are seen, but look at the glory which is yet unseen. It's there, Second Corinthians 4, 17. I just quoted my own words. He says, the sufferings of this present time is but for a moment. And it's temporarily and it can be seen. But there's a glory that is still yet unseen. Which will bring an eternal weight of glory. 
Why we do not look at the seen, but at the unseen. Why don't people get this expected end? Because they're forever dwelling about what they're going through, what's happening to them, what they're suffering, what affliction they have, what trouble they're going through. Stop it. Come to an end. If you talk and keep on talking and keep on referring to what you're going through, what you've been going through, forget the glory. Let's read on. For even the whole creation waits expectantly. There's our word for today. What is your expectation for your future? Waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known. Waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. The sufferings of this present, Romans 8, 17, 18, 19, cannot be compared to the glory that's going to be conferred on us, in us, through us, and amongst us. Christ had to endure sufferings so that glory must come. The glory is the revealing of the sons. He wanted to take many sons to glory. That's why he suffered, paid one offering for all. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, The sufferings of this present time is temporary. Don't look at it. Keep looking for the glory. Have expectation. Colossians 1 and 27 says, So full of glory is Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. So Christ in us, is the down payment that secures you with a prophetic word that you're going to get the other glory. The other glory is sonship. The first glory is child. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become children of God. John 1, 12. I become a child of God if I'm born again. I'm just a baby. The second glory is sonship, maturity, perfection, being like Christ, walking like Christ, talking like Christ, being a son of God. You are my son. Verse 15 of Philippians chapter 1. Some, it is true, actually preach Christ. So change it with, they preach the anointed one. They preach the anointing. For no better reason than out of envy and rivalry, a party spirit. But others are doing so out of a loyal spirit and goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. The other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therefore do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. I thought Paul is saved. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. What does Paul write to the Galatians in chapter 1? He said, God who wanted to reveal his son in me has chosen me before my birth. What did he want to reveal? The Son in me. What does Paul say? Christ must be revealed. So what does Paul pray for the Galatians church in Galatians 4.19? My dear children of whom I am in travail again, till Christ be formed in you. Come on, 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord, in the face of Jesus Christ, we are being changed from glory to glory in the image of Christ. The Son or the image of the Christ. So where will we get His image? If we look in the mirror. So what do you see when you look in the mirror? Yourself. Yeah. What is the mirror? Many translations will say in brackets, the Word. So in James chapter 1, he says, If I hear the Word and don't do it, I'm a natural man. That looks in the mirror and I see myself. So I read the Bible and I see myself. I see my failures, my shortcomings and where I've missed it and where I didn't make it. Then I feel guilty. And when I walk away, I forgot that I feel guilty and I go do the same stupid stuff again. That is a natural man. Now 1 Corinthians 2 says the natural man will not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are spiritually discerned. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 says, If I behold in a mirror, the word, the glory, I am being changed into the image 
What do you see in a mirror? An image. Whose image? Yours or Christ's. What do you see when you look at the Word? Do you see yourself all the time? Your shortcomings? Your you see, oh, this is what I can be. Or do you see what you are? Or are you seeing where are you going to? I know the thoughts that I have for you. An expected end of peace and a prosperous future. I know what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to make you my son. I'm going to place you in perfection. I'm going to bring you forth as my true Christ. <sighs> Come on, we can go back to that 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 and 2 Corinthians 4 verse 14 and 17 which we wrote and in the middle is 4 verse 11. The life of Jesus must be made manifested in my mortal flesh. Romans 8 11, If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in me, he will quicken my mortal body. So while I am in stinking rotten flesh, the life of Christ must be manifested in my body. So Paul says, you have received me as an angel, comma, more than an angel. You have received me as Christ himself. Amen. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, says Jesus. What about us? If you've seen me, you've seen the Christ. Or are we still so caught up with a natural man that we can't move into channel spirit? And say, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Christ. No. That's what Paul more or less said. That's how he received him in the Galatian church. No, he's scared of that. Do you want to be a son of God? If you want to be a son of God, you've got to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Christ. But don't do it and live like son of a devil. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you, you, are, you are sons of the devil. You have the devil as your father. The ones whose will you do, those children you are, says Romans. If you keep on doing the will of the flesh, your, devil, your father is the devil, man. Now Psalm 110 says the following, Psalm 110. He says, uh, sit at my right hand till I make their enemies thy footstool. Then it says, your people, your children... The church, in other words, shall be volunteers, give themselves voluntarily, shall be willing. I've just quoted the King James, Amplified, and New King James. People shall be volunteers. People shall be willing. People shall give themselves willing in the day of your power. And they shall be ruling in the midst of the enemy out of Zion. You see? We want to rule over the enemies. What about in the midst of them and getting them under your feet? I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. When Adam was tempted, or Eve was tempted, Adam was not tempted, says the Bible in 1 Timothy 2.14. Eve was tempted. But when they were tempted in the garden, you know, who was in the garden? Satan, the enemy. He was there. He was there. Where was he when Jesus was tempted? He was there. So where did Jesus rule over him? In his presence. Do you think the devil was there when Jesus did miracles? All the time. You know? Firing up the Pharisees and Sadducees. Who is he to heal on the Sabbath? She said, oh, is it Sabbath? Peter, is it Sabbath? Oh, you are the withered hand. Stand up. <laughs> Stretch forth your hand. Yeah, they come in the temple. Jesus said, what day is it? They said, Sabbath. Jesus said, woman, you are loosed. And they said, why do you always do this on the Sabbath? Why the devil is always there, you know? Jesus said, I want to rule in the midst of the enemies. But if you understand the day of God's power, the outpoured Holy Spirit is there for you right now, you can be a son of God, rule in the midst of the enemies. Now with that in mind, Hebrews 10 in closing. So verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. 
Now that is the first testament to bring in the new testament. That is to take away the first Adam to bring in the second man. Okay? He wants to take it away to establish a new creation. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. As we born the image of the earthy, we will bear the image of the heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 55. So Jesus put away the first to establish the second. Listen to this. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice, his body, for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sang. To find. Hallelujah. We are being sanctified, but we are already forever perfected. If we are in the process of sanctification, we are perfected, our sins are forgiven, we are clean. But Kubus, uh, I still do a lot of things. It depends on which mirror you look at. But it's the same mirror. But what do you see in the mirror? Do you see yourself? Or do you see the image of Christ? But because there's so many flaws in my life. But the offering and the forgiveness was once and for all. You are perfected. So when will we reach perfection? When we understand that when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the propitiation for our sin. And if we confess our sin, He's rightful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't say if we camp around our faults. If we confess them. Father, I've just missed it. He says, thank you. That's fine. Let's go on now. You are forgiven. You've been forgiven 2,000 years ago. It's been accepted when you said yes. From now on, don't live around that story of you're a sinner. You have now been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you are in my sight perfected, forgiven, matured. But you are still being sanctified. So there's a lot of stuff that still must get away. But you must get in your mind that Jesus is now at the right hand, expecting your enemies to be made your footstool. Your enemy. He didn't say Satan. He says in Romans 16 that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. But all the other scriptures makes it plural. Enemies. What is your greatest enemy? Yourself. Your flesh. Your stinking natural carnal nature. The stuff that you do regularly. So let us lay aside the sin that so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Okay, when are you going to start putting that stuff underneath your feet? Till now it's been stumbling blocks. Why don't you cast them down and trample on them? Make them your footstool. Get your feet on your problems. Don't camp around your faults. Confess them. Go on and don't do them again. He who confesses his sin and don't do it again is righteous, says the psalm writer David.